Chapter 15 of The Thing from the Lake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Thing from the Lake by Eleanor M. Ingram. Chapter 15. Not a drop of her blood was human, but she was made like a soft, sweet woman. Lilith. The fog stayed all day. The mist was so dense that it gave the effect of a solid mass enclosing the house. No wind stirred it, no cheering beam of sun pierced it. Through it sounds reached the ear distorted and magnified. All day I sat in my room, reading. There are books which should not be preserved. I, who am a lover of books, who detest any form of censorship, I do seriously set down my belief that there exist chronicles which would be better destroyed. With this few people will agree. My answer to them is simple. They have not read the books I mean. Not all the volumes from the old bookcase were of that character, of course. Nearly all of them were well known to classical students, at least by name. Obscure, fantastic, cast aside by the world they were, but harmless to a fairly steady head. But there were two that clung to the mind like pitch. I have no intention of giving their titles. Ugly and sullen, early night closed in when I was in a mood akin to it. Dinner with Phillida and Vere was an ordeal hurried through. We were out of touch. I felt remote from them, fenced apart by a heavy sense of guilt and defilement left by those hateful books, most incongruously blended with contempt for my companion's childish light-heartedness. As soon as possible I left them. Alone in my room, in my chair behind the writing-table again, I pushed aside the pile of books and sank into somber thought. What should I say to Desire Mitchell if she came tonight? Who was she who was claimed by the unspeakable and who did not deny its claim? Was I confronted with two beings from places unknown to normal humanity? If she was the woman that she had seemed to be throughout our intercourse, how could the dark enemy control her? Even I a common man with full measure of mankind's common faults and weaknesses, could hold its clutch from me by right of the law that protects each in his place. Was she one of those who have stepped from the permitted places? Sarah, the daughter of Rule, who is beloved by an evil spirit who suffered none to come to her. There was a young gentlewoman of excellent beauty, daughter of a nobleman of Mar, who loved a foul monstrous thing, very horrible to behold, and for it refused rich marriages, until the gospel of St. John being said suddenly, the wicked spirit flew his ways with sore noise. I put out my hand and thrust the pile of books aside from my direct sight. But I could not so easily thrust from my mind the thoughts these books had implanted. I could not forget that Desire Mitchell herself had alleged jealousy as the thing's reason for attacking me. What if we came to an explanation tonight and ended this long delirium? Was it not time? Had not my weeks of endurance earned me this right? Resolution mounted in me, defiant and strong. The evening had passed to an hour when I might look for the girl to come. I switched off the lights and sat down to keep our nightly tryst. In the darkness of the haunted room, the thoughts I would have held at bay rushed upon me as clamorous besiegers. Desire! Desire of the world! Desire of mine and of the unhuman thing! Did we grasp at Eve or Lilith? At the fire on the hearth or the cold phosphorescence of swamp and marsh? A drift of fragrance was afloat in the air. 
a delicate stir of movement passed by me. I raised my head from my hands, expectant. "'I am here,' her familiar voice told me. "'Desire, you had to come, tonight.' Some quality in my voice carried to her a message beyond the words. But she did not break into exclamation or question as another woman might. She was mute, as one who stands still to find the path before taking a step. "'You are angry,' she said at last. "'Something here has gone badly for you. I knew that before I entered this room.' "'How can you say that?' I challenged. "'If you are like other men and women, "'how can you know what happens when you are absent? "'How do you know what passes between the thing from the frontier and me?' "'I do not know unless you tell me, Roger. "'If I feel from afar when you are in sorrow, "'why do so many people feel with another in sympathy?' "'You feel more than ordinary sympathy can,' I retorted. "'Then perhaps it is not an ordinary sympathy I have for you, Roger.' Her very gentleness struck wrong on my perverted mood. Was she trying to turn me from my purpose with her soft speech? She had never granted me anything so near an admission of love until now.' It is not an ordinary trial that I have borne for these meager meetings where I do not see your face or touch your hand, I answered. But that must end. Put your hand in mine, Desire, and come with me. Let us go out of this room where shadows make our thoughts sickly. You shall stay with my cousin. Or if you choose, we will go straight to New York or Boston. I am asking you to be my wife. Let us have done with phantoms and specters. I love you. No, she whispered. You do not love me tonight. Tonight you distrust me. Why? Is it distrusting to ask you to marry me? Not this way would you have asked that of me when I last came but I will answer you more honestly than you do me. To go with you would be the greatest happiness the world could give. To think of it dazzles the heart. But it is not for me. Have you forgotten, Roger, that my life is not mine? That I am a prisoner who has crept out for a little while? The gates soon close now upon me. What gates? I demanded. Sacrifice and expiation. Expiation of what? I exclaimed, exasperated. Desire, I have read the book of Desire Mitchell downstairs. I heard her gasp and shrink in the darkness. Silence bound us both. In the hush, it seemed to me that the house suddenly trembled as it had done the night before a slight shock as from some distant explosion. In my intentness upon the woman opposite me, the tremor passed unheeded. She must answer me now, surely. Now! She spoke with a breathless difficulty, spacing her words apart. How did you find the book? It told me. The thing from out there, I admitted, sullenly defiant of her opinion. She cried out sharply. You? You took its gift? You did that fatal madness, and you are here? Oh, you are lost, and the guilt mine. Yet I warned you that danger flowed from knowing me. You accepted the risk and the sorrow. Yet you have thrown down all for a bribe of knowledge. Do you not know what it means to take a gift from the dark ones of the borderland? To brave the loathsome eyes so long and fall this way at last. Yet there may be a hope, since you still live. But go! 
Not tomorrow, not at dawn, but go now. By all that man can dread for soul or body, go now. Not without you. Me? Oh, how can I make you understand? I shall never come here again. Take with you my gratitude for our hours together, my prayers for all the years to come. There is no blame to you because you could not trust a woman on whom falls the shadow of the awful watcher that stalks behind me. I make no reproach, if only you will go. Do not linger. I do most solemnly warn you not to stay alone in this room one moment after I have gone. Desire, I exclaimed, wait, forgive me. I trust you. I did not mean what you believe. Do not leave me this way. Desire. I can say honestly that my next action was without intention. On my table lay, as usual, a small electric torch. Every member of our household was provided with one for use in emergencies likely to occur in a country house, the time of candles being passed. Now, rising in agitation and repentance, my hand pressed by chance upon the flashlight's button. A beam of light poured across the darkness. What did I see, starting out of the black gloom? A spirit or a woman? Were those a woman's draperies or part of the night fog? that showed mere swirl upon swirl of pale gray twisting in the path of light. I glimpsed a face colorless as pearl, the shine of eyes dark and almond-shaped, then a drifting mass of gray smoke, all intermingled with glittering gold flashes, seemed to close between us. The whole apparition sank down out of vision as aghast, I lifted my hand, and the torch went out. Shaken out of all ability to speak, I stood in my place. Did I hear a movement, or only a stirring of the orchard trees beyond the windows? Desire? I ventured, my voice hoarse to my ears. No answer. I felt myself alone. I would not at once turn on the lamps. My haste might seem an attempt to break faith with her a second time. I sat down again, folding my arms upon the table and resting my forehead upon them. Well, I had seen her at last, but how? A wan loveliness seemingly painted upon the canvas of the dark by a brush dipped in moonlight. A white moth caught fluttering in the ray of the torch. Seen at the instant of her leaving me forever, insulted by my suspicions, my love hurled coarsely at her like a command, my promise of security for her visits apparently broken. How dared I even hope for her return? Now I knew why my enemy had guided me to those books that I might read, fill my mind with the poison of vile thoughts, and destroy the comradeship that bound me to desire Mitchell? How should I find her? How free us both? The clock in the hall downstairs struck a single bell. With dull surprise, I realized that considerable time had passed while I sat there. Still, I did not move, weighed down by a profound discouragement. Suddenly, as a wave will run up a beach in advance of the incoming tide, impelled by some deep stir in the ocean's secret places, an icy surge rushed about my feet. Deathly cold from that current struck through my whole body. My heart shuddered and staggered in its beating from pure shock. Go! Not tomorrow, not at dawn, but now! The wave seeped back, receded away from me down its invisible beach. 
Desire's warning hammered at my mind, striving to burst some barred door to reach the consciousness within that had loitered too long. This was the new peril. This was what I had fled from, unknowing the source of my panic, the night before. This was death. A second surge struck me with the heavy shock of a veritable wave from some bitter ocean. This time the tide rose to my knees, boiling and hissing in its rush. Blood and nerves seemed to freeze. I felt my heart stop, then reel on like a broken thing. Flecks of crimson spattered like foam against my eyelids. The wave broke. The mass poured down the beach, tugging at me in its retreat. With the last strength ebbing away from me with that receding current, I dragged the chain of the lamp beside me. The comfort of light springing up in the room. The relief of seeing normal, pleasant surroundings. Truly light is an elixir of courage to man. That cold had paralyzed me. I had no force to rise. Nor did I altogether wish to rise and go. I had lost desire tonight. Was I to lose my self-respect also? Was I to run a beaten man from this peril after standing against my enemy so long? Should I not rather stand on this, my ground, where I was not the lame feller? Down by the lake, the snarling cry of a terrified cat broke the night stillness. It was Bagheera's voice. The cry was followed by sounds indicating a small animal's frantic flight through the thickets of goldenrod and willow that edged the banks of the stream below the dam. The series of progressive crashes passed back of the house and continued on, dying away down the creek. As I braced my startled nerves after this outbreak of noise, the light was withdrawn from every lamp in the room. At the same moment, the electric torch rolled off my table and fell to the floor. I heard its progress across the muffling softness of the rug, across the polished wood beyond, and final stoppage at some point out of my reach. As vapor rises from some unseen source and forms in vague growing mass within the curdled air, so blackening dark the hideous bulk reared itself in the night and stared in upon me. As so many times, I felt the eyes I could not see. The pressure of a colossal hate loomed over me, poised to crush, yet withheld by a force greater than either of us. The venom of its malevolence flowed into the atmosphere about me, fouling the breath I drew. My lungs labored. Pig me! Its intelligence thrust against mine. Frail and presumptuous will that has dared oppose mine, you are conquered. This is the hour foretold to you, the hour of your weakness and my strength. Weakling, feel the death surf break upon you. Fall down before me. Cower. Plead. Now, indeed, I felt a sickness of self-doubt, for the wash of the invisible sea never had come to me until tonight. And there was desires saying that I had destroyed myself by accepting the thing's gift of knowledge of the book but I summoned my forces. Never, my thought refused it. Have we not met front to front these many nights? And who has drawn back, breaker of the law? You return, but I live. The duel is not lost. It is lost, man, and to me. Have you not taken my gift that you might spy meanly on the secret of your beloved? 
Have you not opened your mind to the evil thoughts that creep upon the citadel of strength within and tear down its power? Of your own deed you are mine. My breath drinks your breath. Your life falls down as a lamp that is thrown from its pedestal. Your spirit rises from its seat and looks toward those spaces where it shall take flight tonight. Man, you die. Again the surge and shock of that frigid sea rushed upon me. I felt the swirl and hiss of the broken wave higher about me before it sank away down whatever dreadful strand it owned. My life ebbed with it, draining low. My enemy spoke the truth. One more such wave. My imagination sprang ahead of the event. In fancy, I saw bright dawn filling this room of mine, shining on the figure of a man who had been myself. His head rested on his folded arms so that his face was hidden. On the table beside him a vase was overturned. A spray of heliotrope lay near and water had trickled over scattered sheets of music, staining the paper. By and by Vere would come to summon that unanswering figure to the gay little breakfast table. Phillida would leave her place behind the burnished copper percolator she prized so highly, and come running up the stairs. In her gentleness she would grieve, no doubt. I was sorry for that. But it was a contentment and pleasure for me to recall that I had settled my financial affairs so that my little cousin would never lack money or know any care that I could spare her. Strange how she had been rated below more beautiful or more clever women, until the waif Ethan Vere had set her dearness in full sun for us to wonder at. Pygmy, will you think of another pygmy now? raged the thing. Yourself, think of yourself. Crouch, think of death, corruption, the vileness of the grave. Think how you are of the grave. Think how you are alone with me. Think how you are abandoned to me. But with that tenderness for Phillida, a warmth had flowed through me like strength. Not so, my defiance answered it. For where I am, I stand by my own will. With where I shall stand, you have nothing to do. Back, then, for with the death of my body your power ends. Back, or else face me, thing of darkness, while we stand in one place. At this mad challenge of mine, silence closed down like a shutting trap. Consciousness sank away from me with a sense of swooning quietness. I stood before the barrier on the ghostly frontier. Erect, arms folded, fronting the breach in that inconceivably mighty wall. Above, away out of vision on either hand, stretched the gray, glimmering cliffs. This I had seen before. But behind me lay that which I had not seen. The mists I believed to be eternal had lifted. Naked, a vast gray sea stretched parallel with the barrier. Like it, without end or even a horizon to bound its enormous desolation. Between these two immensities on the narrow strand at the foot of the wall, I stood. Pygmy indeed. In the breach, as of old, the thing whose home was there reared itself against me. Man! it spat. Would you see me? Would you see the eyes once seen by the witch-woman who fell blasted out of human ken? Creature of clay, crumbling now in the sea of mortality, do you brave my immemorial age? It reared up, up, a towering formlessness. It stooped, 
a lowering menace. Man, whenever man has summoned evil since the youngest days of the world, have I not answered? Have I not brought my presence to the magician's lamp? Have I not shadowed the alchemist at his crucible? When the woman called upon me with ancient knowledge, did I not come? I am the guardian of the barrier. Whoever would pass this way must pass me. Have you the power? Die, then, and be gone. With a long, heaving sound of waters in movement, the gray sea stirred from its stillness. As if drawn to some center out of sight, the tide began to recede down that strange beach. Then realization came to me that here was the ocean which, invisible, had surged icy death upon me a while past. The ocean now gathered for the final wave that should overwhelm the defeated. Braggart, my thought answered the taunt, if the witch-woman was yours, the girl desire is mine. This I know. As little as man has to do with you, so little have you to do with the human and the good. Living or dead, our path is not yours. I did not summon you. I do dare to look upon you, if you have visible form. Now in the hush, a sound that I had faintly heard as a continuing thing seemed to draw nearer. A sound of light, swift footsteps hurrying, hurrying. The steps of one in pitiful eagerness and haste. But I heeded this slightly. My gaze was upon that which took place within the cleft in the great wall. For there, in the cold darkness, was writhing and turning, visible yet obscure, as the rapids of a glassy, twisting river might look by night. And as one might glimpse beneath the smooth boil and heave of such a river the dim shape of crocodile or water monster, so in that moving dark there seemed to lie something from which the mind shrank, appalled. Now gigantic tentacles rolled about a central mass, groping out in unsatisfied greed. Now an ape-like shape seemed to stalk there, rearing up its monstrous stature until all that breach was choked with it. It fell down into vagueness, where huge coils upraised and sank their loops. But through all change steadily fixed upon me, I felt the eyes of the unseen. I stood my ground. With what pain and draining cost to my poor endurance there is no need to say. Each instant I anticipated the surge of that returning sea whose flood should smother out the human spark upon its shore. This I had brought upon myself. Yes, and would again to help Desire Mitchell. If I had sheltered her for one hour... The thing halted, stooped. Man, cast off the woman, it snarled at me. Fool, evil goes with her. For her you suffer. Thrust her from your breast. I looked down. Wavering against my breast, just above my heart, glimmered a spot of light. The little hurrying steps had ceased. I thought, if the bright head of Desire Mitchell were rested there against me, how I would strive to shield her from sight of the thing yonder. In the sweep of that will to protect, I drew my coat about the spot of hovering brightness. I felt her press warm against me, I heard the roar of the death wave far out in that sea. Before me, oh, horror of the frontier, what broke through the dread breach? What formed there, more inhuman from its likeness to humanity? What hand reached for me, for us? End of chapter 15 
Recording by Roger Moline.